Hello, Profit First entrepreneurs and thought leaders. I am so excited today. Today, we have a very special guest with us. Her name is Dr. Mary Kelly. Dr. Mary Kelly, she is a PhD. She's a certified speaking professional, and she is a retired commander from the U.S. Navy. She is an internationally known economist and leadership expert and specializes in productivity, communication, as well as business profit growth. Dr. Kelly is the CEO of Productive Leaders, which has sites in Dallas, Texas, as well as Denver, Colorado, but I believe she services all of the United States. Dr. Kelly has been quoted in hundreds of periodicals. These include Forbes Magazine, Money Magazine, Entrepreneur, Yahoo Finance Success, The Wall Street Journal, and a dozen other business journals. Dr. Kelly is a Mensa member, so she's a genius. And she has received several speaking accolades, including accolades from the Air Force Academy, Instructor of the Year. She's also the Outstanding Educator Award. She's received the National Speakers Association Colorado Member of the Year Award, the Navy League Leadership Award, as well as other military awards. While in the Navy, Dr. Kelly served as an intelligence officer, and she later specialized in actually running military bases. Dr. Kelly has extensive experience in human resources, finances, insurance, organizational leadership, strategic planning, project development, and she focused focuses on building successful strategies for business leaders at all levels of organization. Dr. Kelly earned a bachelor's degree with the United States Naval Academy. She has an MA in economics from the University of Oklahoma. She also has an MA in history and foreign policy from the University of Hawaii, as well as a PhD in economics from Greenwich University. Dr. Kelly is an author. She is an author of 11 books. This, these books include Master Your World, 10 Dog-Inspired Leadership Lessons to Improve Productivity, Profits, as well as Communication, 15 Ways to Grow Your Business in Every Economy. Don't we need that right now? And also three 360 degrees of leadership, stop the barking, money smart, how not to buy cat food when you don't have a cat, and why leaders fail, and the seven prescriptions of success. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kelly to our platform. Hi, Dr. Kelly. How are you? You're so nice to go through all that. Oh my goodness. If I were your listeners, I'd be like, oh, come on, get to something that was actually going to do something for me. There's so many things we can talk about today. And what I think a lot of your listeners are thinking about is right now during times of crisis, challenge, and change, what should we be doing? Exactly. And, and, you know, from your experience, I mean, being a Navy commander, I'm sure you are used to dealing with crises right now, right? And this is a major crisis in America. This is a major crisis. And it's not just, of course, in the United States, but it's a global pandemic that nobody was expecting six months ago. And what's amazing to me is that many people who have never been through a crisis before are struggling with getting to that next level of thinking. So for most people, they start out with kind of the rejection. In the beginning, oh, it's just like a bad flu. It's just like a cold. It's not going to be that bad. And then they move into the recognition. Okay, some things are going to have to change, but it's not going to be that bad. And maybe I'll alter a few things that the kids are going to be home for a couple of weeks. And then they get into the realization phase. And all of a sudden they say, gosh, this could go on for a long time. I have to reconfigure my home. Maybe I need another computer for the kids. Maybe I'm going to need help. I need a community co-op. Homeschooling sounded like a good idea, but wow. Uh, homeschooling an eighth grader versus a kindergartner, very different. And then we get very resolute. We're like, okay, we're in this together. We can do this. These are the first four cycles of any crisis. And most people stay in those four cycles. And sometimes it happens all at once. You wake up in the morning with your coffee and you're like, okay, this isn't that bad. Okay, maybe it is that bad. Okay, but we can do it. It's all right. And now I just need to reconfigure something and it's going to be okay. Well, my leaders have to be in the last two phases. And that is the new reality phase and the new realignment phase. And in the new reality, we can't be nostalgic for 2019. We can't go back to the way things were and say, oh gosh, but when things get back to normal, there's never going to be a normal. And then the other part of it is that new realignment. And that's where we have to ask ourselves the hard questions. And that is, what do my customers need for me? What do my employees need for me? How are we serving other people better? What needs to change in terms of my organizational structure? What does my strategic plan look like? How does my leadership need to change? Where can we pivot faster? Where do we need to be focused? All of those questions. And this is why I think it's so exciting to be an entrepreneur right now, but it can also be so overwhelming that some people get paralyzed into inactivity. Oh yeah, I can definitely see that happening, especially with, you know, there's so many things that's going on right now, you know, with just how we have to do business differently, the fear of actually getting sick out there too. I mean, definitely it's a lot for a leader to take on. So Dr. Kelly, in terms of like, how does a leader deal with that? How do they, how do they muster up the courage to be able to 
lead in that that way and be able to focus their team and 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 move all personal things aside. This is why I love your audience because entrepreneurs the whole definition of entrepreneurship is to take risks in order to make money in the market. And part of that of course you can't make money unless you are serving other people in a way that works for them. Nobody opens up say a pizza place that's focused on um, artichoke and shark pizza. No, that is not what the palate wants. And you will go out of business very quickly. This is why the market dictates what it is we should be doing based on consumer confidence, consumer preferences, and the ability for them to buy your products and services. So this is what I love right now is that people who for the past 10 years, they were doing okay because we're on this great roller coaster ride that was just going uphill the whole time. For 10 years, we had this great economic situation. If you couldn't make money in the last 10 years and you own the business, maybe you should have been thinking about doing something else anyway. And all of a sudden, this situation takes a big old spotlight and it puts it on our business and all the cracks are now visible. The great thing about that is the cracks are either things we can fix or things we don't need to do anymore. And it's time to shift to something else. So for many people, this is go time. This is when we need to figure out what it is we're gonna do, how we're gonna do it better than other people. Again, how we serve our employees, serve our customer base, serve our clients, and make sure that we're providing what the market wants of us right now. It is a great time to be an entrepreneur. Oh, it is. You know, one of my favorite books is, is um, Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers. And his book, he talks about, you know, the millionaires, especially those oil and gas millionaires, you know, the John Paul Gettys and things like that. And, and he says that when he goes back and he looks at the history, it wasn't necessarily they came from family or wealth or any of those type of things. It was the opportunity and the time that they developed. And this 2020, you know, even though it's got mass chaos going on, there's so many opportunities, like you said, to develop, right? And become the next great companies that'll leave this world in the next decade, right? Nothing could be further from the truth than the label that was put on the robber barons at the time. And they were called the robber barons. It was, a, it was Getty, it was the Rockefellers. And they were viewed as being these huge, big, fat cats who uh, took advantage of poor people and laborers and all that. But what they did when they entered the market is they provided stuff to people at a lower cost and made more goods more accessible in terms of transportation as well to more people. All of them started out poor. All of them built their fortunes because they had a vision and because they were great entrepreneurs. And this is where I think your entrepreneurs really need just a little bit of tiny help right now. And that is making sure they've got the right vision in place to take them through 2020 and beyond. Definitely. So tell me about how exactly, because we're, you know, as an entrepreneur, we're dealing with so many dynamics. We're dealing with now our people, you know, five months ago, we were able to congregate in the office, right? We were able to look at each other in the face, see who was motivated, who wasn't, motivate them if they needed it. And now it's a virtual world, right? It's a completely different world in a lot of cases of how things were done. How does an entrepreneur start to step into that role of really being able to adjust in a 2020 environment? One of the things I love about working from home is it's a great equalizer. All of a sudden, just because you know Joe Bob was that great fun personality at work and everybody liked Joe Bob and they just thought they couldn't do without Joe Bob and all of a sudden you're going, wait a second, what does he actually do around here? Not very much. And people are surprised, my leaders are surprised by their employees and their teams and their partners and sometimes their contractors who really stepped up. They've upped their game, they're being more supportive. And those folks, some of those folks that were getting by again, on status quo, on their personality, their charisma, and weren't actually producing, guess what? Their finding aren't nearly as valuable as we thought they were. And so because of that, this whole work from home thing, it's forced acceleration of technology, of outcomes. And right now people are being judged and judge sounds like a harsh word, but you're being judged now based on your outcomes, not your personality not you know what you wear to the office, not any of those things. It's what you are delivering to the organization. So the Twitter CEO just came out and said, hey, if you work for us and now you've been working from home and you still wanna work from home, we're gonna let you keep doing that. Well, that sounds great until you realize that, wait a second, I moved to Manhattan to work in the Manhattan office, but now I can work from home. Why would I live in Manhattan and pay this amount of rent, pay a higher cost of living, pay these taxes? I can live in Kansas at a much lower cost of living, be closer to my family. Uh, but then again, the company can hire somebody in Bangladesh to do my job. 
So we all have to be more mindful that while we are sourcing more locally and we're producing more locally, we are still getting talent globally. And we are going to emerge from this a more competitive society. And employees have kind of realized, wow, I have to up my game too. So if you're an entrepreneur, now with 40 million people suddenly out of work, you can now tap into a talent pool that you didn't have before. Those people simply weren't available. And now you can grow your company in a way you never thought possible before. Now that talent is suddenly available to you. Many people who are furloughed, amazing people with great skills, great talents, but maybe that big spotlight that got you know, shined on their organization we're showing, gosh, that department wasn't nearly as profitable as we thought it was. So we're just going to get rid of it or we're going to furlough those people and maybe think about bringing them back. But that doesn't mean those are not talented people. And now we get to scoop up those people and build our business. Oh, yeah. I imagine deliverables become very important. Like you said, you know, you don't just compete now against people in your neighborhood and people in your city. It's not just the people in your country. It's the people from across seas too. Anybody that has an internet connection that has a skill set becomes your competitor now, right? It's a, a whole different world. So, you know, I want to attack Dr. Kelly and some of your military experience because I'm just like, oh, that's just, that's just so juicy, you know, like to be able to get inside. And, and the fact that you ran military bases, I can't me imagine an organization that is more complex with so many different types of people with so many different experiences, backgrounds, and I hate to say it's probably sometimes work ethic too, right? Um, that happens in it are really coming into training and really getting in line to really grab the whole purpose as a whole, right? When you are an entrepreneur, right, and you're starting to lead an organization that's now virtual, that people are not in your face, in your office anymore, how do you motivate these people? How do you get everyone in line? How do you get people on the same page? That is such a great question. So I need to share with you that I spent... Uh, 17 years of my time on active duty in Asia. And so that normally meant I was either working in Japan or Korea or uh, Hawaii or the Philippines or Singapore or Hong Kong or Thailand. It's like exotic but, places. <laughs> oh, I, I, and I loved it. I loved, I loved every bit of it. I love, I had Thai food for lunch today. I mean, I'm just, I love change. I love travel. I love different people. I love all of that. But it does sometimes mean that you're, you know, I'm, I'm mostly comfortable in English, uh, passable English on a good day, not claiming to be anything else. And you're now trying to communicate with people who probably speak another language than what you grew up with, possibly take different holidays other than yours because of their religious preferences and their country's laws. And all of a sudden, you got to figure out how to work on this. So the shipyard that I worked with in Pearl Harbor, we had people from 32 different nations working there when I was there which means all of a sudden you've got to make it work. And what you remember is a lot of people are contracted out because of their specialty. So you don't necessarily get to choose the person who shows up. The skill set arrives and you got to make it work. But it's also the same as being a military officer or a military leader in any capacity. We don't get to hire people. The military sends us people and we got to make it work. So you didn't necessarily choose that person. You didn't hire them. They show up and you've got to quickly assess their strengths, assess their weaknesses, look hard at where you need those people and plug them in those places where they're going to be the best success. Um, Cotter talks about getting the right, you know, butts on seats, you know, get the right people on the bus and then put the right butts in seats. And I think that's absolutely true. People have superpowers. It's our job as leaders to figure out what those superpowers are. And I tell people all the time that my, my heroes were our, our women's gymnastic team from a couple of years ago. They just swept everything. And I'm amazed that these 16-year-old, I'll say it, kids. Yes, I know they're young women, but they're kids to me. But these kids figured out how to compete against each other individually, push each other hard competitively and still manage to work as a team to bring home the gold. And that's what we as entrepreneurs need to develop. We need to be looking at our competitors as being our closest collaborators, the people who are helping us get better, especially during times like this. Every Monday night since this whole thing started, a group of us have gotten together on Monday nights, people who are my closest competitors. And we're like, okay, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? You know, what kind of microphone are you, are you using right now? What's been working well for you? What kind of headset is working well? What kind of lighting do you have in your office? What have you done better so that you can be better on a podcast? Or who's a good podcast person? Have you heard of Suzanne? You know, all these things that we're sharing information on a deeper level. It's not just, hey, how's everybody doing? Good, good, good. Okay, great. Bye. No, we need each other now more than ever. 
as entrepreneurs, sometimes we feel as though we're in a silo. And one of the things the military taught me is, first off, you can't, you can't be in the military without other people supporting you. And your job is to support other people. As entrepreneurs, if we did better in that, if we supported each other better and looked around for that situational awareness of, hey, how can I help somebody else today? If I wake up today and I've got a little free time, can I go on LinkedIn and promote somebody else's post? Can I call somebody and just say, hey, by the way, I saw you did that last week. Great job on that. Can I provide some encouragement? Um, are we mentoring the right people? And many times as entrepreneurs, we say, I'm so busy. And it's true. But we also have to look around and figure out, hey, where am I two steps ahead of somebody else? Reach back behind us, grab that person, get them in front of us, and give them that push forward. I, I call it in NASCAR, it's called bump drafting, when you get behind somebody and give them that push forward. And that's exactly what we need to be doing, I think, as entrepreneurs, is looking around, finding other entrepreneurs, even if they're our closest competitor, and giving them that push forward. And sometimes people say, well, I'm an insurance, and they're an insurance, so I don't want to be in the same BNI or the same chamber group. Wait a second. Not everybody is going to love you, and that's okay. Everyone is not your target market. It would be nice if everybody did love each and every one of us all the time, but that's not what a free market is. So we've got to be looking around saying, you know what? I can certainly help you with this, but I also want to introduce you to my friend, you know, Sally. And Sally really specializes in this, and you might find her really helpful. And then that client might meet Sally and say, you know what? I still want to work with you, Suzanne, and I really appreciate the work that you've done. But at least you've given them the option and you've watched out for their best self-interest. And again, this is where I think sometimes we as entrepreneurs, we're so, I'm not going to say desperate, but we're so eager for that close, that sale, getting that done and securing our client base because sometimes we operate from a sense of scarcity that we're afraid to give a referral to somebody else. But I love the idea that we would think about competition as being a collaboration ship and collaborate with our closest competitors. Yeah, that's really interesting. You know, I think that's where artists have it the best. You know, they can, you can have a country singer of a rap artist paired together and, and they just make beautiful music and, you know, and you're right, you know, that we need that more in our business world when we actually reach across the table and help each other out because truthfully, there's plenty of work for all of us. There's plenty of money for all of us. And sometimes just saying no to the wrong opportunities, right? Says right. Yes. To the right one. So, you know, letting somebody else maybe have an opportunity at something that, you know, isn't a fit for us and just being okay with turning that down is good or looking back and helping someone else out. Right. It's extremely amazing too. And, and I also love to what you said too about, you know, having staff and having teams, putting people in their zone of genius, right? Mm -hmm. Putting them in the place that they're going to shine. And, and you're right. That's really how you get the best output from people too. So I tell people that every single person on the planet is exactly like every single other person. And what I mean by that is we're the same as a car. A car has an engine and a drink cup holder and a steering wheel. We're all exactly the same. All the cars are exactly the same except for the parts where the car is different. And that's why you drive a Subaru, somebody else drives a Prius, somebody else drives a truck. It's the differences that make all the difference. And that's where the magic happens. So leaders have to look at the differences in their people and realize that that is the magic, you know, because we're all the same until we're different. And it's those differences, is, this is why you date that one person. This is why you've got that chemistry with a particular person. And that's where the magic is. And this is where it's so easy in business to hire people who think like you, who look like you, who grew up like you, but that doesn't really help. You're not getting that broad base of ideas. You're not getting that different thought processes that will help push you out of your comfort zone and into a different and better market. I don't want my people to agree with me all the time. Is it comfortable? Sure. Is it easy? You bet. And in fact, if I could hire nobody else but Naval Academy grads who we all understood each other and it's so easy, that's fantastic. But it doesn't make us very relevant. So if you've got two people in your business and they think exactly the same, you probably don't need one of them. And while it's easy and comfortable, it's probably not where we need to be. So great leaders, I think, find the differences in people and they embrace and love those differences because that's where the magic is. Oh yeah. I can imagine if I hire another one of me, I'll just get more of me, right? <laughs> that may not be what the world needs. And it's great and it's wonderful. But then you think, oh gosh, but what I need is somebody who has the skill sets I don't have. This is why I'm a terrible CPA. I hire my CPAs. I love my CPAs. My CPA, no, I don't have, I'm an economist. So I like the idea of numbers and I like the theory of numbers and I like the strategy of numbers, but I do not want to do the balance sheets. Every time I have to sit down and do my own taxes, I got to share with you, um, my toilets have never been cleaner. 
I'm like, I'm going to sit down and do my taxes. Ooh, I could clean the toilets. It's just frustrating to me. And do I understand it? Sort of. Could I do it? Yeah. But it's so much better if I outsource to people who are so much better at it than me. And this is where I think entrepreneurs sometimes we try to do everything ourselves because we can. And I said this to a man, and I hope this doesn't offend any of your audience people, but he said, well, but I can do it. And I said, well, you know, some people can get pregnant. That doesn't mean we all should, you know, I mean, there's, there's just certain things that you can do, but it doesn't mean you always should do that. And this is where I see a lot of my entrepreneurs wasting time and they don't outsource the things they should outsource. So I love the fact that I have a virtual assistant. The Navy taught me how to use a virtual assistant. I had a gal, she was having trouble fitting in in some other places. Well, it turns out she's a great worker, but her circadian rhythm was not good during the day. Finally, I brought her in and I said, so help me understand from seven in the morning till about 11, you are a dynamo. You are amazing. And all of a sudden it's like a switch gets turned off and you just, you're awful in the afternoon. Like, what is that? Do you need sugar? I mean, what do you need? And she said, I've always been a really, really early riser. I said, how early is that? She goes, I like to get up at two in the morning. I'm like, because ah, I do not like to be awake at two o'clock in the morning, even when I was in high school or prom or any, no, I was that kid who was like, it's midnight. I got to go home. I got to go to bed. I'm tired. I know. Super fun. I said, so what would make the perfect work day for you? And she said, oh, I would just love to come into work at five in the morning and work until noon. I'm not bothered by other people. She says, if you just give me a chance to do this, I promise I will make this work. And I was like, this is awesome. So I said, let's start. Let's start tomorrow. Because she loved to go to bed at like seven o'clock at night. That was, that was when her natural rhythms were. And sure enough, I said, great, here's our system. I have meetings till six o'clock at night. I will put the stuff I really need done on your chair. The rest of it I will put on your desk. And then when I come in at seven o'clock the next morning, you will know that the stuff on your chair is the most important stuff. That's what I need ready for me before my eight o'clock meeting. Because we had meetings at eight o'clock in the morning, six o'clock every night. And so she's like, you got it. And sure enough, I walked in the next morning. I left my six o'clock meeting, put the stuff in her desk and everybody's going back to their offices and working for a couple hours. I thought, well, I said I would trust her. So I put it on her chair and sure enough, the next morning it was on my desk and I looked like a rock star walking into that meeting the next morning because I had everything done. So I thought, wow, there's something to be said for allowing people to be as successful as possible by using their innate strengths rather than forcing them to be in a box, in a time slot, in an office environment. You know, not everybody wakes up every morning and puts a suit on. I do every single day, even if I'm alone in my office. It's just how I work best. But I don't expect everybody else to do that. And she taught me that because of, again, how she best structured her life. And as soon as I started my business, I found people, I made a list of my own deficiencies like this, and it's a big list, my own deficiencies. And I said, I need to hire for this, 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 this. And those are the first people I've hired. And those people have been with me ever since. It's been 12 years. That is amazing. I mean, first of all, she's lucky to have had a supervisor like that, that allowed her to pretty much cut half of her day, not only cut, but shift half of her day. You know, that's never happened. So she's very, very lucky that she got that. And then, you know, just for, I, something else that you said interests you hire for your deficiencies, you hire for the things that are not your guests where somebody else can shine. I think that's amazing. And how many of us don't do that, right? We hire because we just don't want to do something anymore, but to actually look for where our faults are and where we're falling short. I mean, that's pretty interesting. That's good that you're doing that. I think it takes us to be very self-aware and also, and my easy, my tactic, and I want to give you some tactics for your group today, because when I first started doing this, I'm addicted to day timers and day runners and organizational things, but I created this productivity sheet and I do one of these each and every day of my life. Um, Saturdays, Sundays, holidays, doesn't matter. And at the top, it's calls to make, it's my follow-up, it's my to-dos, my appointments, my short-term goals, whatever I need to do, I do one every single day of my life. These are on my website, it's a free download. You can fill them in um, if you'd like to do that. I just carry around a pen and paper. I assess how long things are gonna take and that way things don't fall through the cracks, but I needed to put these things together so that I can stay on track. And then all of a sudden I look at things that are my to-dos and all of a sudden I'm looking at it going, wait a second, that same to-do list has been moved from Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday. To, okay, there's something wrong. Why am I not getting this done? And it's me, so I have to be painfully obvious with me. Okay, the reality is you just don't want to do it. You're not good at it. You have to develop a flyer. You're pretty bad at flyers. You need to outsource that. When I realize I'm not getting something done, like, okay, who can I give it to? Who can I delegate it to? Who can I hire to do that? 
because things have to get done. The great thing about giving it to other people to get done is they do it and then they send it back to you and you are not suddenly holding up the whole train. In the book that I uh, co-wrote with Peter Stark, the book is called Why Leaders Fail and the Seven Prescriptions for Leadership Success. We got to interview a bunch of really great CEOs and one of them is a guy named Gary Ridge. He's the CEO of WD-40, which fixes everything, by the way, amazing stuff. And the best piece of advice he gave me was, I have to not be the reason my people can't get their work done. And I just thought that was so enlightening because a lot of times we look around our office and we're like, okay, I'll get to that, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. And we don't realize we are stopping our people from being productive and that's not fair. We can't do that. One of the things they used to teach us in the military is always have a desk drawer. And so you've got your inbox. And at the end of the day, when you want to go home, you take it and you dump it in your drawer. And then you put your inbox back on your desk. So you look really organized. Like you look like you have it together. The problem is, is there's not drawers big enough for that. <laughs> so eventually you got to go through the drawer and actually get the work done. When he said, I can't be the reason people can't get their work done. I thought, wow. That's so insightful. So this is why I create systems and processes and checklists and forms so that if there's, if there's something I've done more than once, I can probably create a form to do it. And I, that form can probably help somebody else. I love that. That's a good idea. I like that, you know, not be superwoman and try to do everything. Let others do so that you don't hold them back. I think that's a different way of looking at it because I think so many of us, we think on the cheap, right? We think on the cheap, like, let me go ahead and do that. I can do that too and that, and it'll cost me less, but then in a day we get nothing done, right? And also, you know, think about it. If you want to make $100 an hour, you have to stop doing the things that you can pay somebody $12 an hour to do and whatever that looks like. And sometimes just having somebody else there who's doing it means you send it off to them. They come back in two days and you're like, oh yeah, you hadn't even thought about it for two days. And now it comes back and it's 99% finished. And all you have to do is put the sign seal approval. Yes, I'm going to change happy to glad, sad, unhappy, and we are good. And that's it. Also, the other part of that is sometimes other people are going to do this stuff better than you. And we have to acknowledge that their ideas may be better. And by giving it to them to do, we are allowing them to explore those ideas in a way that just us in our own brain, oh, it's fine, but it's probably not that innovative. Somebody else's ideas are always worth considering, I think. Oh yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a dream come true. You know, you come in and everything's done for you. <laughs> that sounds awesome. That sounds all awesome, Dr. Sudden, all of a sudden your projects start getting done faster because you've got more people who are doing things. On my team, I have a range of ages and countries. I have two 18 year olds. They are twins, a boy and a girl. And I have an 85 up to 85. And I contract in different countries, about six different countries around the world, because again, it's easy for us to get stale. And by getting somebody else's perspective, somebody else's ideas, somebody else's viewpoint, all of a sudden they see things that I wouldn't see. And sometimes they'll put something in and I'm like, oh, that is so darn clever. Why didn't I think of that? Well, I don't have to think of everything. And a lot of times as entrepreneurs, we think we have to, and we just don't. There's other people out there and we got to hire them and help them help us be more successful. Definitely. And a lot of our entrepreneurs out there, our listeners, you know, they're scaling organizations. And, you know, I read a statistic someplace that 15% of companies get to that million dollar mark. And a part of it is that they refuse to delegate, right? They don't know how to delegate. They don't know how to lead teams. And so, you know, you're right. To get to that level, you have to be able to really work with people and work with their gifts so that they can excel. Now, there's a question I am dying to ask you, Dr. Kelly. Anything. Okay, awesome. One of the issues is, you know, we're in the COVID-19 world, right? And the, and you, you mentioned it very early in the beginning that three months ago, four months ago, you could get away with a different skill set. And now in a, a virtual environment, which a lot of us are in a virtual environment, um, there's some that are still in the same environment, but a lot of us are, that are fortunate enough to be able to continue our work remotely at this point. You know, our skill sets that we necessarily had at the office no, no longer translate to being at home. And that could be because there are children that suddenly need to be set up on computers for schoolwork, a ton of distractions going on. As a leader, how do you work with your organization that is no longer able to shift into the virtual world? So in some cases, people are really struggling. And there's no doubt about it because for many people, they don't have the luxury of an office and a space that's dedicated to just them. And maybe they're trying to get work done at the kitchen table with six kids and maybe a partner who's also trying to work from home now too. What that means is as leaders, we've got to convey our expectations, but we also have to understand that 
people's bandwidth is just shorter. Their attention spans are a little shorter, their emotional level is higher, which means the reaction, the emotional component is something that we have to consider and that the focus is now not maybe where it should be. I think we're getting better at it and we'll continue to get better at it, but there's a couple pluses. First, when all this started and somebody would be on the newscast or whatever, and there was a cat that would walk behind him or something, everybody's like, oh my God, a cat, isn't that terrible? And now we're like, look, a cat, that's awesome. One of the best ideas a company I talked with last week said they were doing is they're going to do a meeting, but they want to do it at five o'clock and they want everybody to introduce their kids, their dogs, their cats, the gerbils, turtles, parrots, ferrets, whatever you got, just because we're becoming more human and we're becoming better at being human with each other, even though we're separated. So I say, you know, we're geographically separate, but emotionally still tied together. And we are, we still need people. I was in Kansas last weekend and I had a t-shirt made and it's, it's got like these little people in a circle, like the globe and they're all kind of holding hands. It says, I'm going to want to hug you. And it could get weird. And, um, and so people are like, that's great because we do need each other. We do need that people presence. We need that humanity, but as leaders, we also have to make profit. So how do you balance this? And the, the short answer is you have to lead for the individual. Your job is to help them be successful with what they're doing. And that means empathy. It means more communication by you, the leader. It means expecting more communication and being okay when you say, hey, close a business. And we used to say this in the military, close a business. I was like, close a business is midnight. And they're like, that's a delaying tactic. I'm like, wait, you don't work till midnight? What's wrong with you people? Um, I meant it sort of disdainfully because you people weren't working hard enough, work harder. But um, in the military, you know, we work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, ship in the middle of the ocean doesn't just stop because, you know, it's Friday at six o'clock. It just doesn't work that way. You just have to keep working. So close of business now has gone back to being midnight. And that's when you say, you know what? I'll get this done after I put the kids together, um, after the kids go to bed, after my partner goes to sleep, whatever. And I can work from 10 o'clock until midnight. And that's perfectly fine. And you, you have to be okay with that. You go, you know, like my assistant, hey, when I wake up in the morning, I'm expecting the work to be done. A higher degree of trust. And in order to get that, you as a leader have to be trustworthy, but you also have to take big projects and put them into even smaller chunks because people need the quick wins. People need to feel as though they can check something off the list. It's one of the reasons I have the checklist I do. I have been known to be chewing the gummies while I write down take vitamins so I can cross it off while I'm still chewing because sometimes we just need the quick wins. Your people as a leader, you have to understand your people need the quick wins. So something else that would have normally taken them four hours, break it down into four one hour jobs and say, hey, I need this done by Friday because, because is a magic word. Because means there's a deadline. Um, I have an entire program on how to help people get control of their email because everybody's email throughout this has just exploded. And part of that is just better communication with due dates, with deadlines, so that people know, hey, this is an important deadline. It's not just made up because it's Friday. This has to happen by this time because otherwise, like Gary Ridge said, we're holding up everybody else. But as leaders, break things up into smaller chunks, even for your more seasoned folks, ask for more frequent communications, text, emails, whatever. I keep a whiteboard of all the running projects and I update it every single day. When people send me an email, I'm like, good. And then create folders in your systems so that you can file things quickly, access things quickly, and encourage your people to create systems as well. And this is where I think a lot of entrepreneurs suffer. As I shared with you before we uh, started uh, recording officially, I put together all these checklist forms and everything like that on how to start a business, how to grow a business, um, how to lead a business, how to lead teams, and how to be productive while you do that while still maintaining a sense of, well, a life and happiness and a family. Because we all want friends and family and all those other things, but we also have to run a business that's profitable. But why reinvent the wheel if somebody else has already done it? Again, this is where that collaborative competition comes in. And I love forms. I love forms for everything. And if somebody else has done a form on something, I'm like, that's a great idea. And I'm going to use it if it's better than mine, for sure. 
Oh yeah, definitely. And especially like in a virtual world where you can no longer walk over to someone's desk and go, hey, I'm done. It's ready to time to hand this off to you. You know, the checklists become critical just for being able to monitor work and monitoring flows and even consistency. So I think that's an amazing idea. And, and I know that you have actually a book that you're going to share with us later on at the end. I'll hold it off because I'm so excited about this book. But Dr. Kelly, one of the things I have for you, and I want to be respectful of your time because um, you've, you've shared so much incredible information with us. What would be the one tip the one tip that you would leave for our viewers and our listeners to really help them. It can be regarding leadership. It can be regarding profitability, economics. Um, What is the one tip that you would leave with us today that we can take to really propel our business for this decade? So I'm going to do two. So the first is based on that econ side. And it's one of my CEOs who started a landscaping company. And he says, you know, you got to know your numbers. You have to know your profits, your losses, your revenues, your costs, your fixed costs, your variable costs. And he's absolutely right. And if your listeners need help on that, on my website, totally free, no downloads, no sign-ins, anything like that. I put my P&L sheets because I needed them for my consulting clients and I needed them. So I started using my website as the cloud before there was a cloud so that I could keep things straight. So all my stuff is there. There's an entrepreneur's budget, a household budget, a personal budget, a starting out budget, as well as a P&L sheet. You got to know your numbers. But the second part is default to the good. And this is where I think a lot of people struggle. They're like, oh gosh, does that person like me? Does the client want to hear from me? Um, Does somebody, you know, sometimes we don't make the call because we're afraid of rejection. Well, when we're on deployment, and this was back again in the 80s and 90s before cell phones had been invented, before email was widely used, that a letter would come in and sometimes you weren't, you were getting letters out of sequence. So all of a sudden you're like, wait, what, wait, what? And what I used to tell my young people is default to the good. If there's two ways to take something, take it in the best possible way. Assume that they meant it in the most loving, the kindest, the best possible way. Because otherwise, self-doubts in our head make us insane. And this is where I see a lot of society right now. People are just making assumptions that is not to the good. And if we could all just take a step back and set the default to the good, default to the good, assume the love, assume the support, assume your clients want to hear from you, assume that you are the solution to their problems, then I think it would make it just a whole lot better for everybody. Default to the good. That is beautiful. You're absolutely right. I mean, just... You know, even the slightest things, you know, the things that, you know, you're on a call and then someone uses the wrong voice or they just seem unhappy. You know, if you, if you assume the good, you know, you let things roll out and turn out the way they're supposed to turn out, right? Versus forcing a negative outcome. So I think that's a beautiful piece of advice to share. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure. I recently got an invoice for um, a printing for something and it was not for my books or my pamphlets it was for wedding invitations and um so you can just and all i could think about is oh my goodness that bride is now getting an invoice for books and she's expecting wedding invitations and so i was fine with it but i was like i've made this phone call right away and let them know everything is going to be fine don't worry but please calm that bride (laughs) down (laughs) because you know people make mistakes it's usually something very innocent and we just have to keep keep being positive and assume that the people we work with are trustworthy. Assume that the right thing is intended. Assume that the right things will happen. And then we just got to work like crazy to make it happen. Amazing leadership advice. Thank you. That is amazing. Now our viewers want to reach out to you. They want to contact you and I just need to know how, what is the best way for our viewers to contact you, Dr. Kelly? Well, you are so kind. And for your viewers today, I have a super special (gasps) present. So um, ProductiveLeaders.com, if uh, first off, if you go to ProductiveLeaders.com and right now for your viewers, they will get, if they um, sign up for the newsletter, they get the 52 leadership reminders that my leaders are using with their teams. And they're just sending one out a week just to keep people focused. And they, my leaders have said they really like that. So that's um, what's going on. So everybody gets that free uh, PDF and then there's room to do some exercises with it and walk you through that. But then the first person who emails my company at info at Productive Leaders will get a copy of the 52 minutes per week. The idea is you take five minutes per week to work through one of the five minute forms to build your business and you build a better business in 52 weeks. That's the idea. So I'm really excited. This just came out about uh, 60 days ago. So it's brand new. We finally put it all together. We've been working on it for about three years. And the first person to email me, Input Productive Leaders, gets it. And if you need any help, if your leaders need any help, it's Mary at Productive Leaders directly to me. And that goes to my email. 
That is awesome. So you guys got that. It's ProductiveLeaders.com, info at ProductiveLeaders.com or Mary at ProductiveLeaders.com. And I will also put the contact information in our show notes so that you can go there too and download to get that information for that regarding that checklist for really being able to up your leadership skills, um, which is especially needed now in COVID-19. And I personally think that having excellent leadership skills is probably the best way to drive profitability in your business, right? Because you'll have less turnover. You'll have people operating at their best. And this was such an incredible gift that, that you gave us, Dr. Kelly, today. So thank you so much for just sharing your wisdom and your experience. And we are so grateful for it. Suzanne, you are amazing. And thank you so much for spreading so much knowledge to so many people at a time when people are grabbing for this information. I think what you do is amazing. And thank you so much for allowing me to be a little bitty tiny part of it. Thank you for being our guest today.